Great. So let me give you a very, uh, very, very short introduction. So Howard Georgiai is the Malincrod Professor of Physics and Harvard College Professor at Harvard University. Uh, he made, uh, uh, of course, uh, very important contributions, as everybody know. Uh, and among them, I, I would like uh, to, uh, to mention just his work on, on grand unification, uh, work on compositics models that I love, uh, effective field theories, uh, his contributions to effective field theories, especially applied in particular to QCD. And of course, uh, everybody knows you uh, for your, your uh, fantastic books uh, on weak interactions and, and the algebras. So the title of, of, uh, of the talk is Effective Field Theories and the Low Energy Limit of Strong Interactions. Please. OK. Let me... All right, thank you very much. Uh, it's wonderful to, uh, to be here, uh, at least virtually. Uh, there are different ways of interpreting the title of my talk, depending upon how tightly one wants to tie effective field theories to the low energy limit of strong interactions and exactly what one means by low energy. Uh, altogether, it's way too big a subject and I'm just going to pick and choose a few areas that uh, I'm most curious about and that bear the imprint of Steve's uh, unique style. Uh, there are um, There are few physics papers that I read for pleasure every few years. Uh, one of these is uh, Steve's papers on um, uh, phenomenological Lagrangians uh, for the Schwinger Festschrift in 1979. And um, I can't resist showing a few quotations from the paper. Uh, the bold is mine. Uh, right at the beginning, I discovered that Steve had visited Harvard and talked to Schwinger uh, in 1966 while I was an undergraduate, probably while I was taking Schwinger's course on source theory. Uh, at this point, what Steve means by a phenomenological Lagrangian is one in which the interaction terms are used only in first order. Uh, having only derivative interactions is crucial because it means that in the chiral limit with massless pions, as the pion energy goes to zero, the amplitude goes to zero unless the derivative is compensated by a pole on an external line. Um, the um, One of the clumsinesses that um, uh, Weinberg refers to here is the starting point. Uh, he starts from the old linear sigma model of Gelman and Levy, which has the right symmetry, but it does, is otherwise not particularly well motivated. And Steve had to compensate by putting in the physical normalization of the axial vector current uh, by hand. <coughs> the other clumsiness is that the symmetry structure is only approximately right. But at least the first order in the pion fields, the pion couplings vanish except for derivative terms, which was the crucial thing. Now here's the fun part. Um, the um, Again, the bold is mine. Uh, I don't know whether Schwinger already knew about the clever mathematical trick of induced representations that he suggested that uh, Weinberg use, or whether he invented it independently. But the idea is this, um, to build an induced representation of the chiral symmetry, uh, you construct a chiral transformation on the matter fields as an ordinary isospin transformation by an angle that depends on the pion fields. And then you find a nonlinear transformation of the pion fields that reproduces the full chiral algebra. The chiral transformation is said to be induced from the isospin transformation by the nonlinear transformation of the pion fields. And this can be applied to any isospin representation. So the isospin transformation is then local, depending on, p on position, because it depends on the pion fields, which depend on position. But because the pion fields appear only in the angles of the isospin transformation, they disappear completely to all orders from any isospin invariant term without derivatives. The Lagrangian depends on the isospin of the matter fields, 
without any assumptions about what SU2 cross SU2 representation they are part of. Physically, this means that it's simply meaningless to ask about the chiral transformation properties of the matter fields themselves. And now to all orders, the pi on couplings all involve derivatives or explicit uh, symmetry breaking terms. Um, the, one of the many things that I love about uh, Weinberg's paper is the deft way that he handles Schwinger's source theory. Uh, paying homage to Schwinger without noting that Schwinger was not really doing anything interesting at this time. And while it's certainly true that many physicists had pieces of the puzzle that Weinberg completed in this paper, Weinberg deserves credit for expressing the idea so clearly and in such generality. As uh, Ricardo mentioned, generality is Steve's specialty. But why is this the right thing to do? Um, one, the paper contains a very clear statement of one of the central dogma, dogmas of effective field theory, that field theory um, uh, by itself has no content beyond uh, Lorentz invariance and quantum mechanics. Um, perhaps Nima will uh, amend this for us later today. Uh, but the key point here is that the new idea is that the momentum expansion can explain in what sense non-renormalizable quantum field theories make sense. The momentum expansion is an expansion in powers of the energy and in this case the symmetry breaking parameters and it replaces and systematizes the notion of smoothness of amplitudes that was used in the old current algebra calculations. This is what is referred to as chiral perturbation theory. But more generally, Steve realized that the momentum expansion is the key to doing reliable calculations in renormalizable theories, including quantum loops. Even though uh, there are an infinite number of parameters and an infinite number of counter terms required, only a finite number of them are required to calculate to a specific precision at a specific energy. And when coupled with the momentum expansion, Weinberg's folk theorem about quantum field theory becomes a powerful tool that incorporates information beyond traditional perturbation theory. So the first thing I want to talk about is where did this paper come from? Uh, it's so wonderful. I want to spend a good part of my talk discussing the history that led up to this beautiful synthesis. Uh, one possible source for this history is Weinberg himself. Uh, this is one of many papers written uh, about that history. It's uh, the opening talk at a conference celebrating the 30th anniversary of his Schwinger Festschrift uh, paper. And it's been, there are many similar talks. Here is uh, Weinberg's sim uh, summary of the pro progression. Uh, the starting point, of course, was Nambu, spontaneously broken symmetry, and so called partially conserved axial currents. And Steve describes his the progression from Nambu and PCAC through the early work on current algebra to his nonlinear chiral Lagrangian that allows current algebra calculations to be done more easily. And then he suggests that he lost interest until the late 70s when he was inspired by Wilson's work on scaling in condensed matter physics and his attempts to justify quantum field theory to his students. Uh, it's a good story, and uh, he writes beautifully, as always, um, but it didn't convince me. I, I think there are some very important influences that are left out, and I wanted to dig into the history a bit, and this talk gave me a good excuse to do that. Um, Nambu's PCAC did not catch on immediately. You can see that in the citations uh, to uh, Nambu's paper as a function of year. Uh, initially, physicists just struggled to understand the physics of the Goldstone theorem, the connection between spontaneously broken continuous symmetries and massless particles in relativistic theories. Um, the um, Steve's paper with Goldstone and Salam, which uh, Ricardo mentioned, was one of many examples 
though of course it was a particularly clear and general treatment. Uh, but after the uh, success of uh, Galman Neyman's uh, Eightfold Way and the Kabibo angle, the game heated up and uh, there was explicit discussion of the chiral SU2 cross SU2 and SU3 cross SU3 symmetries and many applications that depended on the commutator structure. Uh, Steve, as usual, considered a very general situation and worked out the current algebra of an arbitrary number of pions. Even Steve thought that this was complicated. This is a typical page from this paper. Uh, but one beautiful thing uh, that came out of this complicated mess was Steve's calculation of low energy pi pi scattering. Uh, this calculation gets to the heart of the non-abelian Goldstone theorem, and it can be understood very simply classically. Um, uh, Goldstone bosons, a Goldstone boson wave packet is a local twist uh, in the vacuum. And at low energies, uh, the interactions go to zero because the packets look very much like the vacuum everywhere, but like slightly different vacua in different places. So, for example, two pi zero wave packets don't scatter from one another because all of the twists of the vacuum are about the same isospin axis and they commute with one another. So the passing pions can twist and untwist the vacuum, leaving nothing behind. But um, a pi zero and a pi plus correspond to twists in different isospin directions, and the twists don't commute. So now the system is complicated in the overlap region, where one pion twists the vacuum, and the other twists it in a different direction before the first one can untwist it. This leaves behind a little region of space with the vacuum twisted in the direction of the commutator, and this spreads to become the scattered fields. And that's the classical uh, Goldstone boson physics behind Steve's um, pi pi scattering calculation. The next thing that happened was that, according to Steve, he was sitting in a cafe in Harvard Square when he uh, realized that he could find a Lagrangian that, when used in lowest order, would reproduce the effects of current algebra in a much simpler way. This was the clumsy approach that I discussed at the beginning of the talk. So finally, in 1967, Steve follows uh, Schwinger's suggestion and constructs uh, a, fully, a fully invariant nonlinear theory using the mathematical technique of induced representations. So the, um, then there's a break. He says that only after a break of nearly 10 years to construct the standard model uh, was he motivated by condensed matter physics and by his teaching to uh, think again about the, um, uh, the problem and then finally tamed the infinite number of parameters and realized that non-renormalizable uh, theories are perfectly renormalizable and the momentum expansion uh, allows one to calculate with them. <coughs> At that point, he replaces the old fashioned constraints on of renormalizability by constraints on the sizes of non renormalizable terms in the effective theor field theory. And uh, this modern picture of effective field theory is born. So Steve's account makes a really good story, but I think it leaves out many important developments that almost certainly uh, influenced his thinking. And I want to uh, show you why I think so. Uh, these include maths independent renormalization schemes, guts, effective theories of the weak interactions, heavy quarks, and perhaps most importantly, the U1 problem. 
So it's certainly true that Steve was doing other things besides thinking about prions in this period, but not immediately. This was a depressing time for quantum field theory. Uh, Weinberg's model of leptons uh, paper did not make a big splash when it first appeared. I was just a baby at the time, but I remember seeing it when it arrived in my mailbox. And like most everyone else, including I think Steve himself, I ignored it because it didn't look renormalizable to me and I didn't really know how to make precise sense of it. This shows up spectacularly in the plot of the citations uh, to Steve's paper by year. Um, there was equally little excitement when Glashow and Iliopolis and Miami figured out why uh, a charm quark had to exist to explain the absence of nuclear, of uh, neutral current effects that change flavor. Um, I must say the statement of the gym mechanism is very simple. If there are four quarks and they come in two complete families, each of the identical, each with identical weak charges, the strong interactions have an approximate SU4 flavor symmetry and flavor symmetry, flavor changing neutral current effects are proportional to the SU4 symmetry breaking and can be adequately, adequately suppressed if the symmetry breaking is small. I think this is one of the most brilliant and annoying developments ever in particle theory. The reason that I think it's so annoying is that it implies that we have absolutely no idea what flavor really is. And uh, as Ricardo mentioned in the standard model, that turns out to be true. At any rate, these frustrations ended spectacularly um, in 1971, uh, after uh, uh, Toft figured out how to make sense of spontaneously broken non-abelian gauge theories in general, and Weinberg's model of leptons in particular. This obviously is the uh, reason for the jump in citations uh, to the Weinberg and Jim papers, and also to the resurgence of quantum field theory in general. Atuf's work opened up a new region in the map of quantum field theories, and some of us started exploring it by building models, both to see what was possible in this new class of renormalizable models and to try to find the right model. So I will discuss one completely crazy uh, model building exercise uh, in detail. Uh, James Birkane, uh, BJ, did something crazy that was both wrong and uh, important. He came up with a numerological relation for the ratio of the muon mass to the electron mass. And he argued, and as far as I know, this is not published, that the relation was correct um, up to uh, just at the level that one would expect if there were radiative corrections. It's right up to order alpha squared. Now, in hindsight, this seems completely ridiculous. But you have to remember that at this time in 1972, there was no tau lepton, and we sure weren't quite sure what to think about quarks. For many quantum field theorists, quarks were still a shorthand for symmetry properties of the still mysterious strong interactions. <clears throat> that uh, situation would change like dreams over the next couple of years. But in early 1972, it seemed entirely reasonable to construct models in which mu over me is calculable. At this time, Steve Weinberg was still at MIT, and he got interested in the same problem. So we had a little contest between Shelley and me at one end of Cambridge and Steve at the other to see who could compute the muon electron mass ratio. Although I think Shelley and I came closer to the goal, Steve made theoretical contributions that were much more important. He wrote a paper which described a model of leptons, his second and much less well-known than the first. Uh, it was based on uh, SU3 cross SU3. And he reasoned that in this model, after symmetry breaking, there would exist Feynman graphs like the one shown here that could, that might give BJ's formula. This is a brilliant wrong paper. Uh, Steve's model doesn't give anything like BJ's formula. He missed a counter term and the electron mass is actually infinite. Uh, Shelley and I showed this and understand how, understood how to fix it by adding another SU3 
Uh, but the solution was boring because instead of the square root of two in BJ's formula, we got a complicated ratio of heavy vector boson masses. And if we knew all the masses, we'd have a relation, but that didn't seem like much. The really interesting thing about Steve's model is that it is a kind of proto-gut. Uh, the gut-like properties can be seen in a simpler model with only one SU3, with both triplets transforming as threes. The point is that uh, unlike uh, SU2 cross U1, but like all gut models, uh, this SU3 model has gauge interactions that we haven't seen. In this case, the uh, right-handed weak interactions involving the top and the bottom components of the triplets. And also weird uh, uh, doubly charged uh, currents involving the bottom two. To get rid of them, Steve invoked what he called super strong symmetry breaking. Um, he uh, added a, an octet scalar field with a vacuum expectation value in the lambda eight direction and uh, gave it a big vacuum expectation value. That breaks the SU3 gauge group down to SU2 cross U1, as we all know from. Gelman's SU3, but in this case, it's used in a completely different way to give a large mass to all of the unwanted gauge bosons in this model. So these super heavy gauge bosons um, were constrained more by their virtual effects than by direct uh, bounds on production. Uh, at this point, uh, Steve was certainly not thinking about what are now, now called gut masses. In those days, a few or 10 times the W mass would have been plenty to suppress the unwanted interactions to an acceptable level. Needless to say, at, at, at the time, it was a pretty radical concept because we all still thought of the W and the Z as extremely heavy. To invent things that were heavier still was a bizarre act of genius. Um, the um, because there's only one coupling constant in the model, sorry, because there's only one coupling constant in the model, the weak mixing angle is also predicted. And it's predicted to be uh, a quarter, which at the time didn't seem very good, but uh, now seems great. But of course he was ignoring um, renormalization effects because nobody was, which nobody was thinking about at this time, because nobody was thinking about really large mass ratios. It's the fraction uh, in this case, uh, ignoring renormalization, the weak mixing angle is just the fraction of the total charge in the group invariant sense that comes from the SU2 gauge coupling right up here. Steve, as he was wont to do, generalized the question. He generalized the issue of BJ's relation into something much more interesting by expressing what we'd done in a symmetry language. What we found was a model in which the most general renormalizable, renormalizable Lagrangian had no mass term for the electron, so that the kinetic energy terms had a chiral symmetry. But the full Lagrangian did not have a chiral symmetry for the electron field, so that the electron gets a mass due to radiative corrections, and the mass is finite and calculable because there's no counter term to absorb the infinite contribution. Uh, Steve recognized that this thing, sort of thing happens frequently in non-abelian gauge theories and suggested that it might be an explanation for some of the approximate symmetries we see in the world. Uh, the issue may require a little explanation. Symmetry, both gauge and global, played an important role in renormalizability from the very beginning. But nowadays, exact global internal symmetries have a bad name in quantum field theory and we suspect that there may not be any at all. But approximate global symmetries are an obvious and important feature of nature. We knew how to use them by simply assuming that the Lagrangian of the world uh, has a symmetry conserving part that is somehow large and a symmetry breaking part that is somehow small. But this might seem a little artificial if the symmetry breaking small part was governed by a parameter that was in some sense infinite and required renormalization. Steve realized that there were examples of QFTs in which the symmetry breaking term, like our chiral symmetry breaking electron mass, is finite and calculable in 
and calculable in terms of other parameters because it's not gen present in the most general renormalizable theory and therefore no counterterm exists to absorb an infinity. I think that Steve invented the name accidental symmetry for this situation and I'm almost certainly certain that I heard the name from him. It appears in a footnote in his paper on the subject. Uh, in our solution to BJ's uh, challenge, the chiral symmetry of the electron kinetic energy term in, uh, is a, an uh, accidental symmetry. It's an automatic consequence of the constraint of renormalizability. But the problem with these models was that they could not accommodate fractionally charged quarks. And <clears throat> evidence for these from deep inelastic scattering had been piling up. And by this time, it was getting pretty convincing. So the, um, after years of um, experimental results, which were very interesting, but not easily theoretically interpretable, the um, deep inelastic scattering from slack was beginning to make sense and to beginning to look like really interesting, though still confusing quantum field theory. Another interesting thing that happened in this time was that Bouchiat, Iliopoulos and Mayer and Gross and Jakeef reminded us that the existence of triangle anomalies put interesting constraints on uh, these model, models. And um, Bim noticed that uh, three colors of quarks was the right number to cancel anomalies in the electroweak uh, model. So this fit very nicely with the original suggestion of three colors uh, from baryon spectroscopy. So after the discovery of weak neutral currents, the basic structure of the electric electroweak uh, interactions was pretty clear, but the nature of the strong force and the full significance of color uh, was still not obvious. Of course, a big part of the push for quarks came from dimensional transmutation and asymptotic freedom. Dimensional transmutation was described by Sidney Coleman and Eric Weinberg in a number in another of my favorite physics papers, Radiative Corrections as the Origin of Spontaneous Symmetry Baking. The subject is a version of Weinberg's model that I think is pretty uninteresting, but the paper is a how to do it manual of useful techniques in quantum field theory the renormalization group, the loop expansion, the effective potential, and much more, written in Coleman's best pedagogical style. Almost in pass passing, they show how renormalization can convert a dimensionless coupling constant into a dimensional energy scale, characterizing the interaction. I didn't realize at first how important this was going to be. The history of asymptotic freedom is complicated, and I'm not going to get into it except to say that I spent a lot of my time during and after 1973 trying to do useful physics with it. At first though, we were still assuming that we had to break the color symmetry and not yet recognizing the full power of dimensional transmutation. The recognition that color symmetry could be unbroken and the quarks confined developed gradually to many people over that year. And I first heard it from Steve uh, in this uh, paper. Uh, this indeed shows that Steve was thinking hard about current algebra, even during the exciting time when we were building uh, the standard model. And the paper also contains the speculations about what we now call court confinement. And that idea was very important to me personally because it got me and Shelley thinking about unifying SU3 along with SU2 cross U1. So I've told the story of the evening that I found SO10 and SU5 guts elsewhere. So I'll skim over it uh, almost <clears throat> instantaneously. <coughs> but <coughs> the um, uh, we I started by thinking about um, the Pati Salam uh, SU2 cross SU2 cross SU4 model. This is a, uh, a a beautiful model, or almost a beautiful model, they uh, discovered something very beautiful and then ruined it. They were probably the first to write down a model with charge quantization that could incorporate, incorporate fractionally charged quarks. Um, 
And in fact, Brown Pies tells me that, uh, ironically, they may have been the first people to write down the full gauge structure of the, of the standard model, which is contained within their model. And I say that this is ironic because having written down the beautiful gauge structure uh, at, that could explain fractionally charged quarks, they proceeded to do something absolutely gross to it. Uh, they spontaneously broke the color SU3 and the electroweak down U1 down to a subgroup that left the quarks with integral unnumbu charges. When we finally understood that it might not be necessary to break color SU3 symmetry at all and that the mass less gluons might be confined, it was easy to, um, <clears throat> to uh, turn this into something more interesting. And um, basically the first day that Shelley and I started thinking about guts, uh, we thought about it during the day and didn't get anywhere. And then I went home and uh, worked out the structure of the SO10 and SU5 theories in one evening. Um, the idea was, you start with Pati Salam um, and get rid of the ugly symmetry breaking. And then you can immediately realize that uh, the SO, uh, SU4 cross SU2 cross SU2 uh, has an algebra that's equivalent to the algebra of rotation groups, SO6 cross SO4. So any idiot would think of combining these into SO10. And the interesting part was that I didn't have to think about what representation to look at. The spinner representation was the unique choice. So the group theory put the quarks and the leptons and the antiquarks all together for me into a single representation. That was something that Shelley and I had been unwilling to do, and that's why we weren't getting anywhere. Uh, in the Pati Salam model, uh, getting rid of the right-handed neutrino broke the symmetry down to SU3 cross SU2 cross U1. And I asked myself what subgroup of SO10 remained after I got rid of the right-handed neutrino. And eventually I saw that it had to be SU5, and then I could do all of the familiar calculations. And um, the uh, get the weak mixing angle and everything else. Uh, I now looked at the extra gauge bosons. That had been, I'd avoided that in SO10 because it was complicated, but in SU5 it was easy. And I drew the relevant diagram, which was clear that it would produce proton decay. And I was devastated. Um, I went to bed. Uh, I knew the proton was stable. <clears throat> but Shelley, when I told him about it the next morning, uh, was more excited about proton decay than anything else. And he was right, of course. Um, we went up to the library and looked up the bounds and found that our uh, super heavy gauge boson using Steve Weinberg's mechanism of super strong symmetry breaking had to be greater than 10 to the 14th GeV. We won't, wrote the paper and went on to other things. I stupidly didn't include SO10 in a footnote, which gave Fritch and Minkowski the opportunity to find it independently uh, later on. In the next few years, um, I wrote only two papers on guts. One was a conference report about SO10, but the interesting paper uh, for this conference was the George I. Quinn Wein Weinberg paper in which we computed the renormalizations of the couplings in guts and predicted the proton lifetime. Um, the problem that GQW solved uh, was that the then conventional picture of mass in uh, dependent physical renormalization was very inconvenient in a theory like SU5 with very different physics at very different scales. <clears throat> in principle, um, a, a mass dependent physical renormalization should allow you to evolve couplings from the gut scales to low energies and see the coupling splitting. But in practice, it was a hideous mess. So the key idea was that below the scale of the breaking of the gut symmetry, the leading logarithmic renormalization effects were just what we could calculate in an SU3 cross SU2 cross U1 model. And the unification could be put in simply as a boundary condition at the gut scale. Um, we justified this by appealing to the Applequist-Karazone theorem and using different 
uh, mass independent renormalization schemes uh, in uh, different energy re regions. Uh, this was a modern effective field theory calculation, although we did not describe it uh, that way at the time. The couplings in the different regions evolved differently and were connected by matching at the symmetry breaking scale. This was a departure from the conventional view of renormalization as relating directly to physically measurable properties. It fit nicely with the tuft veltmann scheme of dimensional regularization and minimal subtraction, but only if we supplemented it by an effective field theory idea of different theories in different regions. And that idea is in fact absolutely required to make minimal subtraction useful in any theory with multiple energy scales. Uh, I don't have much use for anthropic arguments, but I am enormously grateful to have been born into a universe in which God ha had chosen the parameters to illustrate almost every possible interesting theoretical idea relative to the standard model. Um, and heavy quarks are a great example of that. Um, the, because I'm running out of time, I'll skip over the, uh, the, uh, the details here, but basically the Parton model was really confusing um, the initially because the some parts worked great uh, for the uh, uh, deep and elastic electron scattering but um, it failed badly for e plus e minus and the um, when the uh, many of us were convinced um, by because we tried everything else that charm had to exist and that the problem with uh, e plus e minus uh, the e plus e minus parton model was that charm was being produced now um the uh, uh when as the um, jape psi was being discovered at slack uh, bert richter was actually a, a Loeb lecture at harvard giving lectures on his theory that the rising R that they saw in uh, at SLAC uh, was uh, due to the fact that the electron was a hadron some fraction of the time. Uh, and um, at a uh, lunch for uh, uh, Bert at the, in the department, uh, David Pollitzer and uh, Tom Applequist suggested that they look for narrow peaks in the data. And of course, Bert ignored that. Uh, uh, the announcement of the JPSI uh, occurred a, a bit shortly thereafter. Um, the, um, um, it was actually surprising how long it took to actually see charm, but eventually, um, and the, uh, it's useful to remember that half of the expl explanations of the JPSI in the um, in the famous PRL uh, after the discovery were silly, even things by very famous people like Schwinger. But it ended happily. Charm was eventually discovered exactly where we said it should be. Um, R in E plus E minus was starting to look exactly like Applequist and Hollister said it should. Except, of course, in the meantime, God had thrown us an extra heavy lepton. And in the space of less than a decade, we'd gone from confusion to confidence. And quantum field theory was ascendant. But the interesting point for Weinberg was that we had several new energy scales above a GeV, certainly the charm mass and the W and Z mass, and plausibly a gut scale. And we could no longer ignore the effects of running between these scales. It was becoming obvious that some version of effective field theory was the way to deal with this. And the question was, how does it work? in detail. All of this was in the air, and I just don't believe it did not have an effect on uh, Steve's thinking. As far as I know, one of the first people to really figure out the details was my office mate in the late uh, 70s, Ed Witten. And while his um, calculations are not exactly described in the same language that Steve uses, all of the pieces are there. The last piece I wanted to mention is the U1 problem. Classically, uh, the symmetry 
of three massless quarks has an extra chiral U1, and it is a disaster. Uh, nothing would work. It was um, when the uh, uh, the quarks were not real and were just uh, you just used them to uh, abstract symmetry properties. You could ignore that problem, but that was no longer true as now that the reality of the quarks had become more or less established. <clears throat> the uh, and he, in fact, there's a smoking gun here that shows that Steve was thinking about these issues in 1975 during this period where uh, he says he, he wasn't really thinking about it. This is a delightful little paper. Uh, it shows that changing the decay constant of the U1 current can't help very much. Uh, so if anyone was not confused already, this paper would certainly have gotten their attention. But in fact, most people were already confused. And one reason I think that people weren't trying harder to sharpen the tool of chiral perturbation theory was that it seemed it didn't work and that something important was missing. And uh, again, uh, Atuft came to the rescue. After Atuft's paper, there was no reason not to dive back into chiral perturbation theory and really make sense of it. And that's what Steve did. Um, I, I want to say just a few words in the few minutes I have left uh, about after phenomenological Lagrangians. But my main um, uh, message is that everybody should go back and read this paper. Uh, it's just so beautiful. Um, so the legacy of phenomenological Lagrangians goes in many uh, different directions. And many of the most solid and convincing of these go through Baird. Uh, the, uh, I still remember a seminar by Harry Leutbeiler Weiler, over 30 years ago talking about the program that he and his colleagues had established to push the phenomenological Lagrangian program further. Harry described their superb work testing the theory, and then he compared chiral effective field theory uh, to an appliance manufacturer. And... Um, the, uh, with some revolutionary pat patents. And he said some, in his talk, he said something like, if you like the refrigerator I just showed you, I have a washing machine and a microwave to sell you. He was referring to the fact that they could use the same technology, not just in particle scattering, but in lattice QCD, in QCD at finite temperature and pressure, in QCD in a finite box, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it was, it's a, a, a beautiful collection of, uh, of applications. Uh, finally, you know, citations can be an unreliable tool because, uh, but because I don't have time or the expertise to discuss all of the many descendants of Steve's work on effective field theory, I've just listed some research papers, not review papers, just new research, that refers to Steve's phenomenological Lagrangians paper and which themselves have generated more than 500 citations. Just the titles here show a remarkable story of how far and how widely Steve's ideas have spread. And this doesn't include many influential works that involve effective field theory, but don't involve the chiral symmetry, but they still have their roots in Steve's ideas. So it's an absolutely remarkable leg legacy. And he was a remarkable physicist. And thank you uh, for encouraging me to look into this history a little bit. Thank you. Thank you very much, Howard, for your very nice talk. Mm -hmm.